When I redid my office speakers, I changed the tweeter, but I also did something special with it. I made an adapter plate to fit into the old tweeter hole and the new tweeter actually mounts on the back and the front is cut out in the shape of a horn. And I did that so I could use a lower crossover frequency for the tweeter and that horn does that. And in this video, I'm gonna to try to explain exactly how a horn works. To do that, I'm gonna set up a test and I need to make a new baffle, except it's not a, you know, for a speaker. I'm just making it for this test. And the first location for the tweeter will be like normal mounted flush with the surface of the baffle or the front of the speaker. And whenever possible, you wanna make sure that the tweeter is actually flush with the surface, so it needs to be recessed in. Now on the other end of the piece of plywood I'm using, I'm gonna cut the horn, and for this, the tweeter will mount on the back very much like I did with my office speakers. I could do most of the flare with a 45 degree bit that has a ball bearing on the end that rides around that one and a quarter inch hole. But the last part I had to freehand cut and it turned out a little bit rough, but I don't think that's gonna be that much of a problem. The first test is with the tweeter mounted flush and my setup is to have the microphone one meter away and I'm going to keep that consistent throughout the tests exactly one meter from either the front of the tweeter or say the front of the horn. I'm showing this first measurement being done but I actually had to redo it later because I uh, managed to change the volume on the little amplifier that I'm using when I ran into a problem and it kind of ruined the results on this first run here. So what you're looking at right now is the result from the later test. And you can see it's very smooth. This is a good tweeter. There's a bit of a hump at 1600 and a dip at 3K, but that may be some edge diffraction. Next, I'm gonna take the tweeter out of that hole and mount it on the back of the baffle to use that shallow horn. And this is where I ran into those problems I talked about. While reconnecting the wires to the amplifier, I changed the volume and I noticed that in the measurement, it was significantly higher when it shouldn't have been, but I knew that I'd be flush mounting the tweeter again so I could redo that measurement. And this time though, I put a mark on the volume control so that I could keep it in exactly the same spot. So what you're looking at here is the horn measurement plus the original measurement except the fixed original measurement. And you can see that it is about five decibels higher. The output is the same up around 15K and above, but below that there's an increase from 1500 up to about 9K. And what this does, it gives you more to work with when you're designing a crossover. You can design the crossover for a lower frequency without losing a significant amount of output. And that's exactly how it worked out for my office speakers. And for my office speakers, I used a very simple filter on the tweeter there. It was a single cap that pulled the response down so that it gave me the crossover point that I wanted. So to show that here, I've actually wired a capacitor right on the back of the amplifier going to the tweeter. And you can see the output here. It's the green line. Even though there wasn't much of a horn there, you can see that it was very effective at boosting the output. So exactly how did it do that? Well, if you think about the tweeter being flush mounted on the speaker, when it operates, it's operating on all of the air that's in front of it. Whereas with the horn, the amount of air that's directly in front of the dome is limited to the size of the mouth of the horn itself. And it's easier for the dome to push that mass of air. And the amount of boost that you get increases with the length and size of the horn. And to illustrate that, I'm going to make a bigger one from scrap plywood. I'm setting up my precision miter sled to make the cuts. And the first one is at six and a half degrees. This is a pretty simple horn and I designed it in SketchUp. So I know the dimensions, I know the angles. 
I've got four parts that I'm cutting here with straight cuts. And then I'm going to change the tilt angle on my table saw down to 41.6 degrees, I think. And reset the fence on the sled to 9.5 degrees to cut the rest of the parts. To put it together, I'm just going to use glue and pin nails. This doesn't have to be fancy, it just needs to stay together until I finish my test. When the glue dried, I sanded the outside. I really didn't need to do that here, because this is just a test, but I thought it would look better in the pictures. However, I do need to sand the end that goes up against the tweeter and make that really flat. And to fasten it to the tweeter, I'm going to use hot melt glue. And here's what it looks like on the inside. Now, like I said before, I reposition my mic so that it's exactly one meter from the outside edge of the horn. And you can see just how much higher the output is. In the 18 to 20K range, it's even with the other measurements. Now, if you're wondering about this crazy looking horn and who does that, well, there is a speaker company that makes speakers that has this type of horn straight side like this actually made from wood i haven't heard any but as i understand it they sound really good i can stop there but i have another horn this is one that i made more than 10 years ago my first attempt at casting plastic i think i spent a full week working on the mold for this and it's been collecting dust in my basement ever since and here are the results from that you can see that the output on the lower range is even higher and I don't know exactly why that is. There's probably something with the geometry of the horn that causes that. But once again, they're virtually even up above 15K.